first of all, we should be talking about massive public investment in productivity, levering ourselves onto the cutting edge of the new green. Some people are calling it the fourth industrial revolution. We need clean energy. There's a debate about whether it should be nuclear, whether it should be borium reactors or uranium reactors, wind power, some of the, the um, vestiges of f- fossil fuel that we might need to, to cope with the problems of nuclear power throttling up and throttling down. All of these things need to be talked about, discussed seriously start with energy start with rail start with infrastructure start with business startups all of these things need to be funded by government we could even in the interim offer a job guarantee as some of the heterodox uh, economists um, suggest there are so many things we could do and we need absolutely massive public investment and we don't have to borrow for this public investment it was it's not about borrowing Bonds aren't about borrowing. Bond money, where does it go? It goes in the, it goes in the savings accounts when we pay back later with, with interest, but so for, in 30, 40 years' time. We don't use that money. That's simply to, to set overnight interest rates, to give the government some control of interest rates. All of the money we, we, we invest it, it actually is, comes from a consolidated fund. Now, this is dismissed as money printing, which is a sort of demonic term, as if that's going to cause massive inflation. Well, it didn't after World War Two. It did. It's not in the United States of America at the moment. They're growing the economy and it's not inflating. Inflation, of course, as we know, was caused by price rises and supply shortages during the COVID um, incident. And, and, you know, most inflation is cost push. It seems to me that that is going to be driving inflation up. Uh, by putting interest rates up, not down. And, and we were being told the opposite. Which eventually is what it, what it does. And it makes mortgages more expensive, makes rents more expensive. It makes borrowing. I mean, all businesses are running on credit all the time. They're borrowing just to keep going. There's also huge consumer credit. And don't forget, there's this huge disconnect between the base rate and the amount of money, uh, the amount of interest charged by banks, credit card companies. I mean, that, that's a market. That's a market outside of the base rate. And, that's, and they're operating a cartel. Those, those borrowing rates could be far cheaper, but they operate a cartel to make sure those, those, those rates. And you get ridiculous, you know, things like the prudential way of paying 40% APR. It's, it's, it's crazy. What we, what we need, of course, uh, at a lower interest rates, uh, it's, I would operate a zero interest rate policy at the central bank, which means you don't need bonds to sell to set the overnight interest rate. And I would make that the baseline uh, in the market has to compete at a much lower level, which would bring down the costs of borrowing, bring down the costs of borrowing. Mortgages are cheaper, gives people more disposable income. Therefore, aggregate demand goes up. And therefore, if if we invest in production to meet that demand, we won't cause inflation. But if we don't, if we don't do that, then we will get inflation. So it's all about productivity. It's about investment. It's again about bringing the economy back to health. There are ways to do this. But. One thing and one thing gets in the way, and that is that the private investors who are connected to mass media, who have got politicians in their pockets, don't want public investment to crowd out their private investment. They're against public investment because it's taking their business away from them. My name is Professor Steve Hall, uh, Professor Emeritus to be uh, specific um and i've uh, written a book with uh, professor simon winlow who's still at northumbria university called the death of the left um which traced which traces the demise of the left that's um ideological and political missteps from um the inception of the the labor party in the early uh, 20th century right through to the postmodernist Farago has been with us since the early 1970s. And um, in the final chapter, we suggest ways of um, resurrecting the left by returning to first principles and returning to economic discourse uh, and um, putting culture to one side for a moment in order to find, to regain um, or rediscover, I should say, our, our shared interests, our shared economic interests, especially in uh, this day and age, which has been, of course, at the, at the, in the middle of a period of austerity forced upon us by neoliberal governments of 
the centre left and centre right. So is Jeremy Hunt's big week, uh, his budget speech, um, some announcements. You, I mean, you're you're quite welcome to talk about others if you wish. Uh, are the uh, two pence or two percent uh, cutting of national insurance, uh, as well as stopping the non-dom status. Um, also worth mentioning is things that aren't in there, like for example. Uh, bringing up tax tax thresholds in line with inflation. So more and more people are being caught with the higher tax bans uh, as yeah. wages rise. So uh, what would you what do you make of Hunt's, Hunt's budget? Well, I, I don't know why we call them budgets. I, I, I don't understand. I mean, it, it's, it's simply accounting processes, you know, sh- shifting um, accounting processes, uh, steps in the accounting process in order to convince people that, um, that, that, that they're paying into some sort of pot in, var- in, 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 with, in varying amounts. That you know, the, we put the put up the tax for business flight users. He's knocked a couple of pence off NI, and so he's trying to convince us that he's being fair in the amount of money he's taking from various social and economic groups, putting it into a pot which then pays for public services. It, and, and all of it, Tony, is utter nonsense. This is not how government finance systems work. Taxes don't pay for public spending. We know that the consolidated fund used to be called the common fund pays for public spending. Taxes actually take money out of circulation in order to combat inflation, redistribute. And of course, sin taxes like tobacco taxes to prevent us doing unhealthy things. So I don't know why we call them budgets, because budgets are a a, a word that that, that tends to be associated with household, isn't it? You know, your mother used to budget. My mother used to call it reckoning up. Look, Stephen, I'm doing me reckoning up here where I have so much money coming in from my dad's wages. We have to buy fish, vegetables, etc. There's my budget. We have the mortgage to pay. We have the various um, <clears throat> water rates and everything to pay. And, and there's the budget. It's as if the, 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 we earn money and we spend it on the stuff we need. It, uh, but the households aren't currency issues. We didn't have a shed in the back garden with a money press, you know, or these days, of course, simply a computer putting digits into accounts. So households aren't currency issues. They're totally different to government. So why do we call it a budget? The whole thing is simply smoke and mirrors. And nobody really knows what's going on with the parade in front of the the, the, uh, cameras, uh, you know, every year with this stupid little case telling people that they're going to um, be fair uh, and, and, and they're going to gather in money, put it in a pot and then spend it. it. It just doesn't work like that, Tony. And it's about time, I think, through the education system and through the mass media that we started to tell people exactly how this system works. Look, I mean, you, what you're saying is it, it's uh, a kind of smoke and mirrors affair. But, I mean, you, you, it could have been possible, say, for example, for him to have announced that the uh, you know foreign aid budgets were going to be massively slashed and that there was going to be, uh, money diverted into the National Health Service. So, I mean, there is some sense behind what he's saying. It's obviously for many years now, probably since the the, the time of the Thatcher governments, uh, we've had a similar sort of drift in where this money's going. But, you you know, it's say, for example, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a post-war government, a post-war Labour government made yeah. enormous changes in the way that uh, central government collected tax, who from... Uh, in that case, after World War Two, it was from the, the the rich, the super rich. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, they made big changes to things like inheritance tax to take yeah. these estates off people. So, uh, I mean, I think you're right in that there hasn't been much change over the last few decades. But surely, I mean, there is an opportunity uh, on budget day to say, well, actually, we're going to see spending X on Y and completely differently to what we did the year before. That's right, but they only talk about tax. They only talk about what they're taking from people. They never talk about what they're actually spending it on. Where's the money coming from? Why want, aren't we investing in railways? Why aren't we investing, uh, renationalizing railways? Why aren't we well, investing hang on, in our just, health just, service? Because he did make some big announcement about masses of, of billions going on the National Health Service's new um, IT system, for example. So there is some of that. 
Yeah, the son of that, but that was a complete failure. Why are we investing in the actual on the ground services and the NHS? And as soon as we, as soon as we offered to do that, of course, they said, oh, we're going to have to put up taxes, which might not be necessary because when you employ more people, they pay tax, they pay NI, and all those details are missing. Now I think it's, it, it is all smoke and mirrors, and I don't think what we did after World War II uh, was because, of course, we, we, we set up a progressive taxation, tax system to be fair, uh, but we were spending 243% of, of, of GDP, um, allegedly borrowing it, because but we know that we don't, bonds uh, don't work like that. It's nothing to do with borrowing. We were actually issuing currency, spending it on uh, what was necessary to grow the economy between 1945 and 1960, the highest growth we experienced since the 19th century. We've done it before. We did it quite well. Progressive taxation was an important part of that. And in those days, the budget did mean something because we were actually doing something with the money. Uh, we were bringing out state earnings related pensions. We created the NHS, free education system, dentistry, or everything. We were doing lots of stuff that uh, you know, helped the country to get back on its feet after the war. But we're not doing that now. We're imposing austerity on people, putting up interest rates. Um, closing, which is forcing businesses to close. It's hard on mortgage borrowers. We're doing all of this stuff that's completely unnecessary. Then we hold up this case and say, oh, look, we're going to be fair with the tax situation. It's a distraction. It, it doesn't actually mean anything. Even though you're right, yeah, of course, you know, we can, we can divert some funds, but what we're doing is diverting the, uh, the, the ways we're taking money out of circulation with taxes. So it's not really a diversion at all. The problem okay, is that so no, nobody understands how the government monetary system well, works, well, look, apart from the people who are inside it. Uh, well, uh, and a few people like you have been looking at it for years. So I'm going to give you a blank sheet of paper um, right. with the bullet points for your budget speech that Jeremy Hunt should have made. <laughs> right, OK. Well, what we, well, first of all, I would need time to think of the details. I would need time to look at the details. But first of all, we should be talking about massive public investment in productivity, levering ourselves onto the cutting edge of the new green. Some people are calling it the fourth industrial revolution. We need clean energy. There's a debate about whether it should be nuclear, whether it should be borium reactors or uranium reactors, wind power, some of the, the um, vestiges of f- fossil fuel that we might need to, to cope with the problems of nuclear power throttling up and throttling down. All of these things need to be talked about, discussed seriously start with energy start with rail start with infrastructure start with business startups all of these things need to be funded by government we could even in the interim offer a job guarantee as some of the heterodox uh, economists um, suggest there are so many things we could do and we need absolutely massive public investment and we don't have to borrow for this public investment it was it's not about borrowing Bonds aren't about borrowing. Bond money, where does it go? It goes in the, it goes in the savings accounts when we pay back later with, with interest, but so for, in 30, 40 years' time. We don't use that money. That's simply to, to set overnight interest rates, to give the government some control of interest rates. All of the money we, we, we invest it, it actually is, comes from a consolidated fund. Now, this is dismissed as money printing, which is a sort of demonic term, as if that's going to cause massive inflation. Well, it didn't after World War Two. It did. It's not in the United States of America at the moment. They're growing the economy and it's not inflating. Inflation, of course, as we know, is caused by price rises and supply shortages during the COVID um, incident. And, and, you know, most inflation is cost push. So we can do yeah, that. So, so much we can do. You, but uh, my own uh, observation, if you want to call it that, uh, is in 2022, we had the withdrawal of the troops from Afghanistan at the same time yeah. as we had a so-called fuel tanker strike. Um, well, I was extremely dubious as to whether these massive multinational companies like Shell and BP and Exxon really could not afford to pay a tanker driver to go from A to B. But since there were lots of other drivers around, uh, they could have, uh, I'm sure, managed to get the fuel into the stations. And of course, uh, uh, there is a tactic that's been used for many years, mostly actually in banana republics and uh, the developing world by these companies. And that is to starve the uh, petrol stations uh, of diesel and, and um, petrol in order to jack the price up. So it was an enormous 
leap in uh, fuel prices in 2022. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is bound to go down the, um, the the manufacturing and supply chain and cause inflation. And it seems to me that that was almost done deliberately. But uh, uh, but anyway, uh, the uh, it'd be interesting also. Sorry, to, I mean, I'm interrupting you in a horrendous fashion here, but I'd like to know what you make of this idea of. Uh, putting up interest rates it, it, that's also seemed to me to be completely counterproductive what you're doing is you're you're making it much more expensive for any businesses who have borrowed money or who have landlords who have borrowed money uh, and so of course they're going to have to put their prices up it seems to me that that is going to be driving inflation up uh, by putting interest rates up not down and, and we were being told the opposite which eventually is what it what it does. It makes mortgages more expensive, makes rents more expensive. It makes borrowing. I mean, all businesses are running on credit all the time. They're borrowing just to keep going. There's also a huge consumer credit. And don't forget, there's this huge disconnect between the base rate and the amount of money, uh, the amount of interest charged by banks, the credit card companies. I mean, that, that's a market. That's a market outside of the base rate. And, that's, and they're operating a cartel. Those those borrowing rates could be far cheaper, but they operate a cartel to make sure those those, those rates. And you get ridiculous, you know, things like the Prudential way of paying forty percent APR. It's 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 crazy. What we what we need, of course, uh, at a lower interest rate. Uh, it's I would operate a zero interest rate policy at the central bank, which means you don't need bonds to sell to set the overnight interest rate, and I would make that. The baseline uh, in the market has to compete at a much lower level, which would bring down the costs of borrowing, bring down the costs of borrowing. Mortgages are cheaper, gives people more disposable income. Therefore, aggregate demand goes up. And therefore, if if we invest in production to meet that demand, we won't cause inflation. But if we don't, if we don't do that, then we will get inflation. So it's all about productivity. It's about investment. It's again about bringing the economy back to health. There are ways to do this. But. One thing, and one thing gets in the way, and that is that the private investors who are connected to mass media, who have got politicians in their pockets, don't want public investment to crowd out their private investment. They're against public investment because it's taking their business away from them. And uh, th- th- uh, in, in, that's in the, the problem we have. In the 60s and 70s, we had quite a lot more... I mean, some would say it was around about 50-50, public sector and private sector. 40-60, well, yeah, yeah, about 40-60, which is a fairly healthy balance. And don't forget, when you're investing in public infrastructure, that gives businesses a chance to get going. It actually attracts private investors. And this is, again, what happens for the war. Uh, and, and also, back in those days, Steve, there were also terms we don't hear anymore. Uh, one of them was the, the balance of payments, and it'd be interesting to see whether you think that really matters. And the other one, of course, is people's disposable income, because we've heard literally this week that the British government has presided over the biggest fall in living standards since the Second World War. And so this amount amount of money in your pocket, and in fact, when they were out box popping on budget day, this is what people were saying. Is you, we just need to have more disposable income. So can you address those two terms, uh, disposable income and this idea of balance of payments, of whether it matters whether money's flowing in and out of the country. Well, the balance of payments is an interesting um, you know, anomaly, really. In 1978, we had a 350 million trade surplus, a bit of money sloshing around in the economy. We had Tony Benn suggesting a national enterprise board. We had Peter Shaw writing the manifesto for the Labour Party, the best manifesto I've read, suggesting we use North Sea oil revenue to, to completely refurbish British industry, which is what we should have done. We didn't actually need nice North Sea oil revenue, but it would have given us a cushion on, on which the public investment could, could, could have been better. We probably should have allowed the car industry to go private again. British Leyland was a bit of a disaster. But for the big stuff, steel and rail and and, and energy, that should have been, you know, we we should have remodernized the whole economy and followed the German route. So the trade balance was important in that sense. Some of the heterodox economists argue it's not important because, you know, if we if if people are, are accepting our currency for real stuff, then imports are, are, are a good deal. 
But there are all sorts of cultural aspects that we have to take in hand because, of course, you know, we stop manufacturing, we stop making stuff. We become consumers, consumer subjects, which has huge cultural impact. We lose skills, changes educational priorities. So I think the trade balance is more important than heterodox e economists uh, uh, argue. And I would go for more exports, certainly an import substitution where we can. We can't have a manufacturing fetish. We're not going to be able to outproduce China in terms of small electronic goods and that sort of stuff. But what we can do is get ourselves on the cutting edge of this. We were the first industrial nation. We should reskill. We should be investing in technical colleges, engineering, get ourselves on the, on the front of this, uh, the cutting edge of this, this new industrial revolution and start to be productive again. Now, well, disposable big incomes, and, you know, what happened after the war with the, the teenage phenomenon uh, is a huge amount of disposable income that we didn't have uh, during the, the, the austerity of the, of the, of the uh, 1930s after the great, you know, uh, uh, the Wall Street crash and the depression. Disposable income is, is, is hugely important in, in aggregate demand. Henry Ford wasn't who once said that there's no use payment wages. Uh, pay my workers wages uh, that, that won't buy the cars that they make. So if people don't have enough disposable income, then what, we, what, what happens is, is that productivity goes down. There's no point in producing, for, you know, so we have to have a decent amount of aggregate demand and we have to have disposable. Now, if you put up interest rates, people are paying interest rates on debt, on mortgages, on credit cards. That shrinks disposable income because all of that money is going on paying interest to money lenders, to creditors. And you create what Steve Keen calls debt zombies, private debt zombies. We can see these countries all over the third world that are owing so much money in debt that they don't have enough disposable income to keep aggregate demand up to the level where it will incite new production and, and productivity. So it's, it's, it's very, very important that people have money in their pockets. But it's, as I say, it's equally important that we're making stuff because it's supply if supply goes down, then, then you will get inflation. You will get inflation with supply problems. So we need supply, a, a balance of imports and manufactured goods. And services, because don't forget, you don't have to have widgets and girders. You don't have to make widgets and girders because services, doctor's services, nurses' services, they are goods. So if we have plenty of these goods and services, if we have a healthy economy, get aggregate demand up, disposable income. And we actually, you know, you know, people might start enjoying life a bit more, Tony, you know, instead of walking around the streets looking worried because they've got to pay their credit card, the mortgage at the end of the month. Well, and I mean, what, you, you describing um, these zombie countries. Well, I'm looking at the website um, nationaldebtclock.co.uk. Yeah. Uh, getting up very, very close to three trillion, which, which is basically three thousand thousand million. Uh, that's a, that's 3, our national billion. debt. That's our government on national debt. Yeah. National debt. Yeah. yeah but that's so, all about know, are we that's, not that's heading different. towards being a zombie country ourselves? No, or maybe we're already no. there. Because we owe that debt in our own currency or easily convertible currencies. We're about level with the dollar and the euro. The problem with debt is when you get a country like Weimar Republic in the 1920s or you get a, like Argentina or a country like Zimbabwe or Venezuela, Argentina, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Germany, and then they owed that debt in dollars. So the problem is when you owe debt in a, in a foreign currency that's far more valuable than yours, that's when you get problems. When you owe so-called debt in your own currency, then the central bank can actually just pay this off. It's, it's, it's very easy. It, it, well, maybe, maybe a slight exaggeration, very easy, but it does have to be paid off. But you can you can always manage that debt far easier. So when, you know, the American debt, I don't know what it is at the moment. Is it something over 21 trillion? It doesn't matter because they're, they're, because they're absorbing that, that debt in their accounting processes. And they're simply making sure that there's money in the, enough money in the economy to create enough demand for production. And well, that's look, what I'm, we do. I'm on nationaldebtclock.co.uk, which is an extremely mesmerizing site. It's like, uh, it's actually around about £10,000 a second. Does that matter? It's going up that much? Not really, no. Not if it's had debts in pounds, no. Not being paid off in pounds, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, it's not really debt, not, not, not in the strictest sense of the world. OK, so are there any authors that you'd recommend if they want to get their heads around this? I mean, economics is a bit of a black art, isn't it? A bit of a dark art. So are, are there any well, uh, good, good authors around apart from your good self? 
Well, well, absolutely. Um, if you read anything by, um, let me see. Let, let, what's the best? Star? The best, the go for Fatsy and Mitchell, F A Z I and Bill Mitchell, um, and it's called Reclaiming the State. And that will tell you all about how the monetary system works, where we get money from, how we can spend it, how we can invest it, and how we can get our economy back uh, into into good health again. Uh, anything by the heterodox economist Steve Keen on debt will tell you how debt works and, and, and how some countries be turned, can be turned into debt zones, what other countries, like I said, like ours, can manage our debt. So there's all sorts of uh, heterodox uh, economists out there. There's, there's a plethora of them uh, that we can read. But start with Farsi and Mitchell and with Steve Keen. And Richard Murphy's blog is very good, too. He's a professor of accounting at, at, at Sheffield. And um, he'll tell you all about how tax works and, and how the government produces currency and how tax takes that out of circulation and helps to control inflation and all of the rest of these processes. If we don't forget neoclassical economics taught in schools at A level and throughout the university system is simply neoliberal ideology. And that's all it is. And it's, it, it's, it is, it is not a factual scientific take on how economies work. It's yeah, pure well, ideology. I mean, Richard Murphy, he came up with this concept during the Corbyn era, didn't he, of the people's QE? That's right. I think um, it was probably slightly mis- uh, misnomer because QE um, isn't actually um, what we think it is. Q- QE actually it, it, it isn't um, a currency issue for, for spending as such because it, it, it disappears into the bank's reserve accounts and it's actually taken out of circulation. But I think he used that term because QE was popular at the time, wasn't it? Because the government were bailing out the banks. Because the banks have made such a mess of things. Don't, don't ever think these people are competent. Don't ever think they really know what they're doing. Because 2008 proves beyond doubt that they didn't. And I'm a big fan of Steve Keen, you know, Rabini, other, other economists who, who predicted this financial crash. Because they, they knew how the economies worked. And they knew yes, I mean, I, I can remember interviewing Steve Keen a couple of years ago. And, and he used this phrase which stuck in my mind, which I used on the um, headline on YouTube, which was that the euro was a suicide pact. uh, And that one went absolutely astronomical. Thousands and thousands of people were looking at that. But I I think I I he was absolutely right, because, you know, when if you're in the eurozone where you're using euro, you're you're effectively owing debts in a foreign currency and you have no control. For instance, Greeks could have rescued their economy. They still had the the Greek currency was the drachma, wasn't it? They still had that. They could have devalued that currency, made their prices cheaper. Flooded the country with tourists because such a beautiful place to, to visit, as you probably know. Flooded the country with tourists, boosted their economy again, boosted their tourism th- through tourism and start themselves get the, because they had control of their own. But they didn't have control of their own currency, so they had to keep inverted commas borrowing from the from the um, European Central Bank and getting themselves into debt. And because that's not their currency, they're not in control of the currency. They don't have their own c- central bank. Then they effectively were in the same position as Weimar Germany. Obviously not as serious because that was a, an absolute catastrophe. The war reparations, the collapse of German industry. And obviously n- not nowhere near that, that, that same. But if, in principle, in the same situation of owing debt in a, in a foreign currency. So it was a disaster. I believe in Europe, uh, but I don't believe in the Eurozone zone at all. No, uh, and, and let me just um, mention my favourite book of all of these, which I mean, I try to, as a journalist, find stuff which is which cuts through the jargon and uh, it's it's accessible, easy to understand. And one of those books is by a guy called Michael Hudson. Oh, uh, wonderful. The, yeah. the Destiny yeah. of Civilization, oh, Finance, yeah. Capitalism, Industrial Capitalism or Socialism. And really here what he's saying is that there's these two different types of capitalism, finance capitalism, which where, is where money can buy up everything, including politics, the press. Yeah. Industrial capitalism is where the uh, government actually steers um, the investment toward things like industry and Absolutely. actually has some sort of an influence. Which is what I've been suggesting, in investing in, in, in pro- productivity. Phil Mullen, the economist, is wor- worth um, a read. Mariana Mazzucato, The Entrepreneurial State. And another excellent book by Carlos Hernandez called Fiat Socialism. And Carlos lays out the whole 
Um, heterodox position, focusing mainly on, on MMT, modern monetary theory, lay, lays out the whole pos- position and shows us uh, in, in detail what we can do with that money and, and how we can boost economies and return to some sort of uh, stability uh, where people have enough di- disposable income and have to, they don't have to worry constantly about their future and worry about the end of the month. There should be a bit more joy in this country. Well, I mean, too. yes, and also finance should be there to serve the public, Absolutely. the ordinary people, not to enslave people. Uh, well, well, one of the, I mean, he's been accused of being a conspiracy theorist. Um, Michael Who has? Saying Michael has, yeah. different, these, well, I think we all do. The, yeah. uh, the, the, the These different forms of capitalism, particularly the difference between industrial capitalism and finance capitalism, is at the heart of the big dispute going on right now in Europe and in other parts of the world as well uh, between uh, the Russians, the Chinese and the West. So the West are saying we want finance capitalism. Uh, The Russians are saying, no, you've got to have a, a, you know, a a fully functioning democratic elected government to steer capitalism uh, and not let it take everything over. So what do you make of that accusation of him being a conspiracy nut or is there something to that? Well, I, I don't think Michael Hudson is a conspiracy nut. I don't think I'm a conspiracy nut because the evidence of neoliberalism planning this project from their first meeting, the Walter Lippmann Colloquium in Paris in uh, 1938. There's a very good book by um, Quinn Slobodian called Globalists. And this isn't a, a, this isn't sort of David Dyke or a, one of his past. This, this is a Harvard uh, University Press publication, bona fide. Uh, University Press, and he traces the history of neoliberals as a project. And when they met in 1938, they decided that states were dangerous because of what had happened with, uh, in Russia and, and in Germany with, with Hitler and Stalin, that market forces will control economies and bring p- peace and prosperity. So I don't think it was, it was evil intent behind it necessarily, but they were a group of Austrian bankers whose business had collapsed because the Habsburg Empire had, had, had collapsed. You know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had started to fall apart. And they decided it would be better to roll this project that world, so to turn everything over to the market. And don't, when you listen to the news, don't the BBC, they're saying, what are the markets saying? You get this reification. Well, the markets can't say anything. What we're talking about are market traders. So it's not so much a conspiracy because that implies secrecy. There's nothing secret about that. They're just doing their business, but nobody understands what it is because nobody takes the trouble to actually work it out. And it is rather complex and labyrinthine. I'm not an absolute expert myself. They're doing things that I don't understand. And I, I need to find out m- more about their, some of their operations, about how these asset management corporations operate and then why, where they invest and how they invest and how they make the decisions. But derivatives market was, came, you know, that, that, that ballooned up after 2000, about the, around about the year 2000. There's good old, um, I'm not a Marxist, but there's good old Marxist principle of the, the falling rate of profit. Well, profits were, were falling in, 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 in the, in the 90s. The, the whole globalist project was starting to prove rather shaky and fragile. You can only make so much money carting plastic rubbish over the Indian Ocean from China. It was all starting, the profits were starting to go. So they had to find new ways of making profits. So they invented these derivatives markets, gambling and credit default swaps and collateralized, basically selling debt to each other and and selling insurance policies on top of that debt. So the more debt there was, consumer debt, uh, the, the, the more they could sell. So they encouraged people, the credit card culture that began in the 1980s of this country, had been part of the American culture for much earlier, of course, encouraged people to get into debt, take out more mortgages. And then we got the subprime. They were encouraging people to take out mortgages on houses they can't afford, only to get that debt and so they could trade it in the derivatives markets. And then the whole thing collapsed in 2008. We knew that was an opportunity to go back to productivity, to start to win best in production to get the country back on the food. But no, what they did instead was impose austerity. Why do they impose austerity? Why do they put up interest rates? Simple. Interest rates, high interest, punish borrowers, punish businesses, reduce aggregate demand, reduce disposable income. But who benefits? Money hoarders and money lenders. Money lenders who want to lend out money and they want their loan repayments to be worth the same uh, or something similar 
um, as to the, as they were when they were lent out. So in five years' time, they want their loan repayments to be worth something. So they don't want inflation. They're the ones obsessed about, about inflation. We've had okay. inflation for we've had inflation for hundreds of years. Then in the late the Middle Ages, there were compl- all economies inflate. Why? Because people keep putting prices up. All economies inflate. Inflation wasn't a big problem in the 1980s because, of course, made your mortgages cheaper, didn't it? You so got a hang on, because a, sometimes you get bubbles bursting, like the housing bubble has several times, and absolutely. the prices are coming right down. Absolutely. They're so you, you know, I remember standing at pubs to, to talk with someone who was, well, I, I won't be rude, you know, but, but was you know not really au fait with the sort of things that they're saying. Oh, Steve, the house prices are going to go up forever, and I said, don't be daft. They can't go up forever. They'll, they'll, they'll crash. You can't inflate economies like that, and, 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 and you know, forever. Uh, and, 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 you know, it just wouldn't happen then, of course. The whole thing crashed in 2008, and I was right. I took them uh, all, all my friends, to see a film called The Big Short. Did you have you seen that? Yes, Brad it's excellent, it. yeah. Yeah, and they all came out of, that, out of that and said, God, Lord, Steve, you were right. You know, but it took a movie. It took a movie to get, you know, to get, to get it across. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be the it? first time. It's like the post office scandal. But you mentioned yeah. this... Um, uh, MMT, modern monetary theory. Yeah. Uh, finally, can you just explain in a nutshell? That's the first time I've heard that term. What what you mean by that? Well, modern, modern, modern monetary theory is um, one of the heterodox positions. We have uh, post Keynesianism, new Keynesianism, modern monetary theory, positive money. There are there are, there are different positions. Now there, there are things they agree what agree upon. Uh, one of the things they agree upon is the role of tax in taking money out of circulation and the ability of the government to, to um, issue currency and invest. They all agree on that, that basic principle. They have uh, some, some differences, uh, some quite major differences, but MMT is one of the positions. It's one of the stronger positions, I think. It, it has flaws. I think they underestimate the power of the bond vigilantes and currency speculators to attack currencies, you know, remember like Soros did in the early 90s. They, under, they underestimate that. They underestimate the cultural impact of an import, uh, so, uh, of an import, a country dependent on imports, as I was talking about earlier, because, you know, do we want to turn ourselves into consumer drones queuing up around the, the, the shop waiting for the latest iPhone, or do we want to be teaching people how to make stuff? I, I'd rather than go down the latter path, uh, but I'm, maybe I'm a bit old-fashioned. So they, they all have flaws, but MMT, I think, has the most pristine understanding of how the government monetary system works from the consolidated fund, the debt management management office, the ways and means account at the central bank, how central banks create reserve accounts for the private banks, how money is put into circulation. If you want to know about that, look at MMT, look at modern monetary theory, because that will give everyone a grounding into how this system works. And then once you have that grounding, then you can start to di- make your own decisions about which of these positions have more to offer. But I would, I would start with MMT to develop an understanding of how the government monetary system works. Would you like to just uh, plug your latest books, that sort of thing, uh, website? That- well, I, I don't have a w- website, but um, if you if you have a look at uh, uh, academia.edu, I'm on there. And I, 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 I don't look at that. I just read. I just today saw an enormous amount of views and citations. So these are looking up for us, only like thirty six thousand or something like that. I'm being conceited and showing up. Shouldn't do that. But look at me. Uh, my name's Steve Hall, Professor Steve Hall on Academia Edu. I'm a bit of a polymath. I'm not an economist by trade. I'm a sociologist stroke economic historian stroke social science.